There we go. Okay, recording has started. So thanks to everybody for joining us today. Today we have Megan Reed from SAS Pulse joining us. Uh, she's going to be going over P agronomy. And then after that, I'll be talking about our Alliance Seed P varieties. So I will let her take the floor. Okay, well, thank you for having me today, Chris. I really appreciate it. Can everyone, I can only see you, Chris. So if there's anything that comes up in the chat, can you monitor that for me, please? Um, yeah. Perfect. Okay. So thank you for having me. Uh, I've titled my presentation P101. Um, I was asked to present on, you know, just general agronomic practices for producing a good pea crop, and then as well as some things to look for for 2024. I've got quite a bit of information, so I'm going to move through it fairly quickly. Um, and yeah, I'll rely on Krista to, to monitor the chat because I cannot really see it here. Okay, oh, oops. to start with, so um, all of you are scattered across Western Canada. Um, I'm presenting specifically Saskatchewan uh, pulse acreages here, but as a general rule of thumb, uh, Saskatchewan is the largest producer of pulses in Western Canada, so we're kind of the lead when it comes to uh, the amount of acres. And when we look at the established pulse crops, typically pea and lentil, those are our lead pulse acres. Then we also have minor crops, so fenugreek, dry bean, fava bean, soybean, and chickpea. And over the past, you know, four to five years, we've seen our pea and lentil acres continuing to decline. And interestingly, in the last couple of years, our minor crop acreages have started to increase. So a large proportion is chickpea little bit of faba bean and soybean in there, and then some dry bean and just a sliver of fenugreek on top. You can see that line is kind of holding about the same. Um, and the reason we're seeing a decline in our major crops of lentils and peas and an increase in our minor crops is due to a number of issues, but largely aphanomyces, so root rot complex, um, herb herbicide resistant weeds, so specifically kochia, and then some fungicide insensitivity for some pathogens that we're seeing in the lentils and peas. Um, in particular anthracnose and lentil, but we're focusing on peas today. And so, um, as I previously stated, these are kind of the topics that I'm going to be going over as well as what to look for in 2024. I'm not going to touch on chickpea health issue, but that is another issue that we do see in our pulses in the province. So to start, plant stand considerations. So early season considerations, what do we need to consider uh, when it comes to seeding rates, plant stands, early season pests, and so on. So just to start, uh, pulses, peas and lentils, and chickpeas are indeterminate are determinant crops, but they have an indeterminate growth pattern. So uh, they have hypogeal germination, which means that the cotyledons and seed coat remain beneath the soil surface, and the first two nodes are actually beneath the soil surface, meaning that if there's a heavy frost, we can have regrowth from those nodes, or if there's a complete cutoff, like a cutworm comes along and chews that up, that seed does have the ability to send out another shoot. So they're, they're hardy. Peas are relatively frost and cold hardy, and you can still get a crop after suffering a pretty heavy frost. But indeterminate growth, what that means is that they will finish at the end of the season, but they need moisture and or nitrogen stress to encourage seed set and maturity. This also means that vegetative growth can continue during the reproductive growth and that flowering and pod filling will continue simultaneously or alternately if temperature and moisture permit. So we get, I don't know if any of you have experienced this, but at the end of the season, guys will go out and reg loan if we get or desiccate if we get a nice big shot of rain afterwards, those peas can start to regrow. And we see that in most of our pulse crops. And that's part of that indeterminate growth pattern. So they need stressors to, to um, really set in and instigate that shutting down period and senescence. When seeding peas, we want to seed them early. So we're aiming for late April to mid-May, targeting soil temperatures of roughly five degrees Celsius. It's important with all of our crops, but um, with pulses in particular to use clean seeds. We want low seedborne disease and high germ. You want to target plant stand populations about 75 to 80 plants per square meter and seed about 1.2 to 3.2 inches deep. Honestly, in this drought, in the dry conditions, we're chasing moisture. Lots of guys are, are sinking them a little bit deeper to chase that moisture. Those seeds do need moisture to contact in order to instigate that germination. Um, in wetter years, we've I've had guys pull up to even half an inch deep. So it's really just dependent on the level of moisture. Anything past three inches, three and a half inches, you're gonna that seed is gonna run out of juice to get that shoot up and above the ground, and you could have poor emergence if you go too deep. Um, we do recommend rolling peas in particular. Um, 
you can roll from seeding right up into the seventh node. If you're getting into uh, larger size pea crops, it's recommended like with other crops to do it on a hot day where those plants are flexible and they can bounce back and you can eliminate some plant breakage at the soil surface. But rolling to eliminate those furrow ridges and uh, deal with some of the rock issues can help with earth tag when you go and harvest. So pulses in general, and I can move this little dialogue box I have here. Uh, pulses in general are nitrogen fixers, right? We know this, they're legumes. Some are better than others when it comes to the individual crop types. Peas can fix on average roughly about 50% of their nitrogen requirement, but are able to fix up to 80%. In comparison, faba beans are incredibly good nitrogen fixers and they also have a high nitrogen requirement. But our pea crops typically about 50% up to 80% capability, depending on the level of nitrogen that's currently available in the soil. So what's left over from your fertilizer the year before and what's able to mineralize throughout the growing season. If there's more than 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre, you will see a significant reduction in nitrogen fixation. So if we have um, a canola crop the year before and that was a crappy crop and it didn't use all the fertilizer that was applied and you inoculate, you may see there's a good chance you'll see a reduction in, in nodulation on those peas, but that doesn't necessarily mean that um, it won't be able to, to fill those seeds and fill those pods. It's peas are lazy, legumes are lazy. If they, Whatever is the easiest way to get nitrogen is how they're going to do it. So um, if you do have guys that have ground that is high nitrogen re residue levels, just it's something to be aware of that they may not see nodulation, but you can still get a crop. Next, I'll move this back. And so to that end, like I said, they can fix up to 80% of their nitrogen. Um, if you have 25 to 30, 35 pounds of N available, that can delay nodulation. So you'll just have a later onset. More than 50 can completely inhibit nodulation. Typically we see nodulation occurring at three to four weeks after seeding. So um, you've got a, a couple node size plant, that's when nodulation is gonna start to occur. Uh, peas are highly sensitive to seed placed fertilizer, but they do have uh, a higher or a relatively high FOSS requirement. And so we need to have strike that balance. So putting a little bit of starter FOSS in row, some MAP, maybe a little bit of potassium in there is really great, gets your peas off to a good start. And then side banding the rest is a, is a great way to go. Other things to consider is seed treatment. So like I said, we want to use clean seed, but see, peas, because they can go in early, they can handle cooler soil temperatures. Um, those temperatures also align with a lot of the, the temperature regimes and perfect conditions for a lot of our fungal pathogens to infect those pea seedlings. So diseases like Pythium, Phytophthora, Rhizoctonia, Fusarium species, and particularly Aphanomyces. Uh, we want to get early season protection against those root rots and that root rot complex and seed treatment is a really good way to do this. These are susceptible to both seed and soil-borne fungi. Um, typically those diseases can infect the plant at any stage, but they're the most susceptible to significant yield loss if that infection is early and we it is unchecked. So um, if that plant isn't able to develop that nice big root system, form those uh, relationships symbiotically with rhizobium and form nodules, it's going to hinder the the production throughout the rest of the season. The later in season these root rot infections occur, the better off uh, you, the better the yield is. So the less yield impact we typically see. Um, greater infection typically occurs in wetter soils. So that's pretty common when we had those wet years, 2010, 2011, 2012, root rot kind of hit the, hit the stage then. And we really saw how peas responded to getting what we call wet feet. Uh, warm and moist soil conditions will favor fungal growth, but cold and wet is also detrimental as well. So different pathogens like different types of soil. Rhizoctonia likes it a little bit warmer. Uh, Fusarium species like it cool and wet. Just depends on the pathogen. So seed treatment is really, really important. If a grower is using uh, liquid or peat-based inoculant, it's important to make sure that you're matching, that grower is matching up their um, compatibility with their inoculant to their seed treatment. Most of the ones on the market today are really, really good at compatibility. The company's been working with them for a long time, but there are some um, that aren't able to treat at the same time or sequentially with liquid inoculants in particular. So that's something to keep in mind as well. So early season pests, what should we be watching for? So wireworm, um, they can go after peas. This is a an image, I believe, of a lentil plant. 
yeah, I'll move that down. Sorry. Um, but I'm sure we've all experienced wireworms in the past. Um, hollowed out seeds and dead seedlings, stems that will be shredded but not completely cut off. And you could be missing row sections or in otherwise healthy stands. So they tend to feed along crop rows. Uh, seed treatment will protect against this, against this pest. We do need to have insecticide in them, in that seed treatment com, um, product in order to protect against wireworm. Cutworm, similar story, uh, but if anyone's never dealt with cutworm before, they typically like to, you'll find them on south-facing slopes where it's warm and sunny. They will feed in patches, so you'll see a patch get bigger and bigger. They live beneath the soil surface, come up and sever like little lumberjacks, severing off that plant right at the soil surface or just below. And this is a really nice image of cutworm damage in chickpea. This is common across all of our crops, particularly in the north and eastern sides of the province where we might have some peat pockets. Um, they will love that type of soil. There's a number of different types of cutworms, but again, you can use insecticides uh, based seed treatment to help protect against these. Another pest that has been emerging in uh, Saskatchewan and in Western Canada is pea leaf weevil. So this past year we had um, some hot spots for pea leaf weevil damage in the province. They absolutely love pea and faba bean. They can also feed on chickpea. Uh, this pest will overwinter as adults in perennial legume fields, so say sir, milk, veg, clover, alfalfa, anything that's a biennial or perennial. Um, what we're looking for is this notch clam feeding on the newest leaves, so those clam leaves that haven't opened up yet. You want to look for these very telltale notches. This is what the adults look like here in that bottom image, and the arrows are pointing to the very kind of clearish white transparent eggs. The thing about pea leaf weevil though is that once you see the adults the eggs are probably already laid and it's the larvae of this pest that causes the biggest damage because they feed on the rhizobium in the nodules of the pea plant. So the larvae will burrow into those roots and eat the nodules from the inside out because they like the bacteria that form those nodules and once we see the adults it's too late. The only way to protect against this is again to use an insecticide based seed treatment. Oh, I wanted to go there. I had a map here. Oh, it's not showing. Anyways, so the hot spots for pea leaf people last year were northwest Saskatchewan was really hot and then all down the east side of the province. So if you're in Manitoba, pea leaf people could be coming over into your area. Uh, the eastern side of, you know, central Alberta, pea leaf people also, it's not going to stop at the border around Lloyd and North Battleford. Look for those again this year. Growers should be using an insecticide based seed treatment. The next thing that I wanted to talk about, so every year the Ministry of Saskatchewan Ag Ministry does a disease survey. And so what we look at is incidence and prevalence. And incidence is the number of plants that are assessed that have test positive for disease. And prevalence is the number of fields that are a yes, no for disease. And in our pea crops, this is what we saw in 2023. So across the province in Saskatchewan, we're seeing really high um, really high prevalence of fields that have a phantomyces or root rot complex. And so that's those fungal pathogens that we talked about earlier, the Southeast 100%, Northwest 100%, West Central 100%. Um, we're seeing a lot. The field numbers that were surveyed weren't really high, but overall from the fields that were surveyed, 90% of the fields tested positive for a phantomyces. The other disease that we'll talk about later on in this presentation is microsphorella. So that is the sexual, um, sexual, sorry, portion of the Ascochyta life cycle that infects peas as a foliar disease. So they also conduct foliar assessments uh, throughout the season and microsphorella this past year, as you can see, quite prevalent in 2023. When we look at the severity and the incidence of these, these pathogens, however, though, uh, what we want to look at in particularly for the root rot is that this is rated on a one to seven scale, one being completely healthy, seven being completely dead. And while incidence, so this is the number of plants within those fields that tested positive uh, for these diseases. So root rot complex, you can see again, southeast 82%. That's not going to stop at the border. So Manitoba, be looking there. Um, northwest, again, 79% and not going to stop at the border and northwest in particular has the worst severe or the worst severity rating of 3.4 out of 7 so our our fungal pathogens in that root rot complex are really taking a hit out of some of these areas within the province um, as far as microsphorella 
<clears throat> excuse me, lower incidence levels and lower severity. So even though we had quite a few fields that had it, not causing huge economic impact. And that is to be expected in drier years. So when we talk about root rot complex, I've already named some of these pathogens before, but these are kind of the four horsemen of the root rot apocalypse that we refer to. The leading two would be a Phanomyces and Fusarium, but not to leave out Pythium and Rhizoctonia. And I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on a Phanomyces. So why is it so challenging? So Phanomyces is an oomycete, meaning that it produces these thick-walled, long-lived oospores. And if you can see in this image, those circles with that halo of another circle around it, that outer circle, that halo, is that oospore cell wall. And that cell wall is thick, which means that it can, it allows this pathogen to remain dormant in the soil for a number of years. I've seen research stating 10 years. I've seen research stating up to 20 years. These oospores can remain dormant. And then they activate when there's a host present, so a pure lentil plant, when the conditions are right, so saturated soils, and when the temperature is right, so about 22 to 27 degrees Celsius. So this pathogen is soil and waterborne. It will only germinate in the presence of a host. And because of these thick cell walls, it is difficult to extract from bulk soil. So we do have some methods of identifying it from soil, but it is very challenging to extract from bulk soil. And it's also difficult to replicate the disease incidence and severity that we're seeing in the field um, in the lab and replicate that in the field setting back and forth either way, because it typically occurs in a complex with those other pathogens. And so when we look at um, how do guys manage this, what's the impact, what does it mean for their farm? These is, this is two different uh, lentil fields side by side. And the only difference is that the image on the left had lentils or had a pea crop one more time in rotation. So we're looking at the difference of a one in four to a one in eight or a one in six in this situation. Yeah, this is one in eight. Sorry, this is one in four. And it just so happened that the year that the additional year that there was peas, it happened to be wet. The next time they grew lentils, this is what happened, whereas this field didn't have lentils for eight years. So we're we're saying anywhere from one in six to one in eight years on rotation, but it's dependent on the grower. It's dependent on the farm and their risk assessment on pretty much by field. Now you would think because this is a new MI seed, it loves saturated soils, that drought should have a beneficial effect to this disease incidence. Unfortunately, it's not. So this is a quote from Dr. Sabina Beniza. A year of drought will not make a big dent in the number of viable spores because of that thick cell wall of that oospore, meaning that we're not gonna see a reduction in the oospore levels and the inoculum level in our fields. What we need to manage is what was the crop like the last time um, there was a lentil or a pea in that field? What were the conditions? Was it saturated? Did you have a yield impact? Was there root rot? And that should determine when and if a pea or lentil should go back into that field. So what we know so far, again, long live oospore resting, uh, oomycete resting spores, needs moisture for infection. Pea and lentil are equal for susceptibility. Inoculum builds up over time and conditions are favorable. So every time there's a pea or lentil grown in that field, conditions are met, root rot occurs, that inoculum, those oospore levels will continue to grow and we don't know how to get rid of them. Ideal pH range is 4.5 to 6.5 and soil temperatures for germination of those oospores is from 22 to 27 degrees. So this is where it gets tricky with seed treatment. Seed treatment is really good at controlling Rhizoctonia, Pythium, Fungal species, Fusarium species, but by the time that a Phanomyces hits that peak window for germination and, and those oospores releasing and finding their host, it's about the middle of June which typically is when that seed treatment is starting to wear off or is worn off. As we've got about 21 to 35 days of efficacy on our seed treatments in most pulses and most crops for that matter, um, for the fungal component, fungicide component. So right when that seed treatment's wearing off is when a phanomyces tends to, to hit its stride and really take off. So we've got this, it's tricky to control and we've got some pretty challenging uh, conditions. The problem, all, another problem is that Fusarium is typically, these other pathogens in particular, Fusarium will open the door, Phanomyces will just come rolling right through it like the big old Kool-Aid man. So that's why we see it's so challenging to work with and identify and replicate and find solutions for because it occurs in that complex with these other pathogens. Seed treatments will um, control 
or have suppression on those other fun fungal pathogens, but for aphanomyces, it is suppression only. And I want to stress that over and over again. There isn't a product on the market that actually has control of this, this pathogen. And the C treatments out there will have suppression only in a low risk situation. So if a grower had a, a high aphanomyces or a root rot issue that the last time they grew up here lentil in that field, Honestly, the recommendation is to pull that crop out of rotation for six to eight years. Don't risk putting it back and rely. Think that relying on seed treatment is going to be the answer because it won't. The best uh, way to keep your crops um, healthy or tolerant or give them the best fighting chance is to do what we do when we're trying to stay healthy as well. So when we're when we get sick, it's typically because we're stressed. We've run, you know, we're not drinking water. We're not getting enough sleep. We're not eating well. Same thing with our crops. If we can give them a really good balanced uh, fertility package, seed treatment, high seeding rate, um, you know, good soil tilth, good drainage. It's not compacted. All of these things will contribute to the crop being able to withstand a root rot infection, even if that pathogen is present. Unfortunately, those are the management tools we have so far. Rotation is really the only key right now, and we are working on it, but it's a uh, it's a very challenging issue. When I talk about fusarium species, so I've, I've kind of gone through them. I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but if you're in the field and wanting to, and you're seeing um, blackening or redding on the on the stems and the roots of the crown, this is what you're seeing in this image on the right here. Um, it's probably fusarium or a combination of these pathogens. If you split the center of that plant open and you see this very classic red discoloration down the center of the stem, that is classic. Uh, Fusarium species infection. Um, the reason that I bring up fusarium species is because we have serious cross pathogenicity issues across our rotation. So fusarium species can infect more than one crop. Um, and I've highlighted the ones here. So in pea and chickpea, Avanacium and Solanae are highly aggressive. In lentil, Avanacium and Calmorum. For fun, barley can host all of those pathogens. So barley uh, is a host to Avanacium, Solanae, and Calmorum. Wheat, Avanacium and Comorum. And two of these pathogens actually are highly aggressive in all the crops tested. And so it's really challenging to, to be able to reduce the fusarium inoculum because we're host, we have a host crop every year in our rotation, essentially. And so this is where it becomes even more challenging to try and solve the complex issue in pulses. So moving on, herbicide resistant weeds, uh, herbicide options, and our outlook for 2024. So to begin, this is a nice little graphic from um, Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers. They did a really good job of this. So this is showcasing the growth stage early season of a pea plant. So we have our, you know, germination started starting. Then we have that first clamshell uh, emerged out of the soil, and this is past the second node. Then we move into our uh, second node above the soil, third node, and the clamshell is the new growth, and then so on and so forth. And when we look at our critical weed free period, that is the two to five node stage. Our in crop herbicide application window is typically on most herbicides two to six nodes, so it's very tight. Um, a field pea can produce a new node every three and a half days under good growing conditions. So in one week, you can move two nodes. And if you only have a four node application window that overlaps for three to four nodes, it's, it's about a week. So it can move very, very quickly, a week to a week and a half for herbicide applications. And so we're looking at this size of pea plant is typically when we should be doing our in-crop herbicide application. And peas are a very poor weed, uh, weed competitor. So they don't, they're not very competitive when it comes to early season weed competitions. So winter annuals like cleavers, uh, kochia, those kinds of weeds can really, really impact our crop stand and our, have yield impacts if we don't control them early. Now, looking back or looking at 2023 as far as moisture conditions, because this will have a serious impact on what guys are able to do and where they can put their pea crop in 2024. So soil conditions um, at the end of the fall and at the end of harvest in October, early October, not quite the end of harvest, you can see it was pretty dry. So this is a, the more red and orange, the drier it is. You can see, so most of the province, poor soil, moisture conditions at the end of the season in 2023. Cumulative rainfall, just going to move this, throughout the growing season from April 1st to October 2nd, anything that's <laughs> anything that's yellow or darker 
into the brown is very short on moisture. So even our, you know, wettest parts of the province are dry. What does this mean for herbicide applications? Okay, so I'm just going to reduce this entirely. So for herbicide carryover risk, this is what we're looking at now. So when we're looking at moisture conditions throughout the growing season, the later a herbicide application was made last year in 2023, the higher the risk that there will be a herbicide carryover risk or issue in 2024. So if we had in-crop happening June 13th or later, this is the risk map for in-crop or for carryover for 2024. And unfortunately, pulses, particularly peas, are highly sensitive to in-crop herbicide injury or carryover injury. So there isn't really any part in the province that is, is risk-free. And as you can see, I don't have a map for Alberta, but this red zone doesn't stop at the border. And we start to see a little bit better as we move into Manitoba, but I don't know what moisture conditions are like over there. You guys tend to get some more moisture than we do, but it still is is significantly drier than we've seen, than we would like to see, particularly at this time of year. And so that leads me into, you know, potential seedling damage that we could see from herbicide carryover moving into the spring of 2024. And so this is just some nice images of um, what seedling damage or crop injury looks like. And I know we have lentils and chickpeas on here, but the symptomology will be the same. So this past year we saw, and even in 2023, we saw clopyrrolid damage in lentils from two years previous. So from a wheat or a barley crop, you know, two years prior to, to 2023. And that could still hold true. That could happen again this spring in pea or lentil in all of our pulses. This is what pyrosulfatol damage looks like in peas. Plumioxazin pinching in lentils, so you see this pinching right at the soil surface, and metribuzin, metribuzin flash in chickpea, which won't be an issue for our pea crops, but it it definitely was prevalent this past year. Um, just another shot. So we have Infinity, we have Everest. So this is what the carbazone carryover looks like in peas. So you can see node stacking here at the crown, crops kind of growing itself to death, and then um, bleaching out at the growing point. Similar again, so that pyrosolvital infinity here uh, in peas, and then swollen nodes and clopyrrolid carryover from peas as well. So this is what we were seeing this past year, and I would expect to see some more of that this coming spring. Uh, we'll see if this works. So this is Fox News, uh, Great Falls, Montana. So not too far south. Um, this is just this past summer. So huge astronomical kochia plants. This is all kochia. Um, and each of these plants, so these are huge plants, kochia plants. On average, we typically say I've seen in the literature anywhere from 30,000 to 50,000 seeds per plant. These plants are massive. They're, you know, 50,000 to 100,000 seeds per plant. Um, kochia is a major, major issue across most of Western Canada, and it is creeping further north. Oh, how do I going to go next? There we go. So when we think when we talk about kochia control, um, we have confirmed with throughout the province and so Saskatchewan and Alberta that there is uh, two, two, <laughs> two, nine, fourteen, four, so four way resistant biotypes, uh, herbicide biotypes of kochia. Um, there was group fourteen confirmed last year in Saskatchewan, and group four confirmed as well this past year just throughout some work that Dr. Sean Geddes and Sean and or Charles Geddes sorry and Sean Sharp have been, been conducting this table is showing all of the actives that are registered for the control of kochia in pulses the green is pre-seed so their soil applied pre-seed and some post-harvest applications um, the yellow is just pre-seed and then the orangish tan is in crop applications. So now when we consider that amount of kochia and uh, the resistant biotypes that we currently have confirmed throughout Western Canada, this is what's left. So the situation in kochia, the reason I included this is because the situation is dire. Um, applying more herbicides is not working. So what we're left with for pre-seed is edge and tough. Um, Rival is on there as well, 
Zidua, so peroxisulfone, and then Incrop, we still have Tuff and Viper, but there's not a lot left. And so we need to look at other methods for controlling kochia because this weed is absolutely taking over and causing guys to take out peas and lentils from the rotation, not just the aphanomyces of the root rot complex. And so managing kochia, we only have a handful of chemicals left. We need to look at other options. So growing soybeans that have the Enlist 3 uh, packages and then cultural methods. So if you have a grower who is growing peas or, or another pulse and they're in kochia country, we need to look at other methods. And so mowing or swathing, increase those seeding rates. Kochia is a poor competitor. So increased seeding rates can help significantly narrow that row spacing. So open available soil for it to grow. Seed earlier. Mechanical. Um, so interrow cultivation, mechanical, mechanically removing them, um, use VR mapping and seeding. So either for spraying and or seeding and then character building, which we have in here, which is essentially get your kids to go rogue or summer student. Um, the next issue that I want to talk about or thing to watch out for is fungicide insensitivity. And so we do have a number of um Foliar diseases that are of concern in our pulses for peas, the main one is micro microsphrella, as I'd mentioned earlier. And fungicide insensitivity is a major issue in our ascochyta pathogens. So here what we're seeing is ascochyta blight and chickpea, microsphrella blight and pea, and anthracnose and lentil. Um, all of these different fungal pathogens, foliar pathogens, are confirmed strobular and resistant, group 11 resistant, or have an insensitivity, insensitivity to those uh, fungicides that have a group 11 in them. So strobies have one target site and that means there's only one gene that needs to mutate in that pathogen in order to be insensitive to the control by a strobularin. And what we're seeing is, you know, 10, well, 14 years now of uh, strains of microsphrella that are resistant to strobularins. And so uh, cross-resistant, cross-resistance among, amongst all strobularin actives is present and confirmed. Um, and this is because we have broad spectrum fungicide used on many, many crops, not just in our pulses, but group 11s are applied across all of our crops in rotation. And in some crops like lentil and chickpea, we have repeated applications. We typically don't see that in peas as much because typically it's only one, one cycle or one infection period of microsphrella throughout the season, um, in our pea crops, but that doesn't mean it's not capable of infecting more times in, um, more temperate or Southern growing regions. And so tips for microsphorella, scout for symptoms from the 10th node to early bloom. Uh, this is typically around mid-June to late July. And plan to apply a foliar fungicide at early flower or when at least one flower is open on most of the plants in the field. So you're targeting that early flower window. And this is really because most of the products that are registered are uh, preventative, not curative. And so you want to get it on at either the first sign of disease or first flower. Uh, this is a, a faded kind of image of what microsphrella blight looks like on a pea plant. So you can see the speckling, um, speckling brown spots that will form these lesions that will continue to grow. Those tan lesions will spread across the leaf surface. Um, use broad spectrum or use multi-mode of action products. So if you are looking at microsphrella in the field and you're looking at your product list, there better be another active in that tank mix that has control of microsphrella blight not just relying on the strobularin because if that's what you're going after and you're relying on that group 11 it's not going to control it and it's just going to make the problem worse when looking at insects and management strategies so these are going to be later season insects we talked a little bit about the early season ones cutworm um, pea leaf weevil wireworm these are going to be later season insects and what we can do about them and so P aphid, aphids are, are an issue. Um, and we're looking at some uh, group three insecticide insensitive aphids now populations that are being studied by Dr. Sean Prager and Tyler Wist here in Saskatoon. Uh, but P aphids can be hosted by peas, faba beans, lentils, chickpea, dry beans, lots of crops. They love them all. They feed on new growth. So the plant, it, wherever the plant is moving sugars to. So that new growth, nice, juicy, healthy growing points. Um, and they are sucking insects. So they will suck the sugars and juices from newly developed flowers and pods, which means that there is the greatest yield risk during flowering and early potting. And when we look at peas, our thresholds are two to three aphids per eight inches of plant tip. So you look at the top part of the plant and if you have two to three aphids within that top eight inches of that plant 
or nine to 12 aph aphids per sweep. So if you have a sweep net, you can go out and do one 180 degree sweep. You only need nine to 12 aphids per sweep. So it's a very low threshold number um, before we're gonna start to see economic, economic damage in our pea fields. The other bug to, one of the other bugs to be aware of is lagus bugs. So this is, um, the image on the left is a nymph. So wings aren't fully developed yet. It's nice bright green with those uh, dots on its back. And then on the, the right image is a fully developed adult with fully developed wings and they turn brown. So lagus bugs, I've typically encountered them in canola, but they all, they will also feed on pea and faba bean. These are again, sucking and piercing insects, just like our, our aphids were. And same, same strategy. They will field on the reproductive parts of the plant, such as flowers and buds and that growing stem or that growing point. And so our greatest yield risk is during flowering to early potting. They will cause hull perforations and both the adults and the nymphs will actively feed on, on new flowers and buds that are forming. And in peas, our threshold is 10 or more lagus bugs per 25 sweeps. So we need, um, if you do quite a lot of sweeps, so not very many per sweep, but um, it's important to get out there and and take a look. If you're seeing, if your canola has, has lagus bugs, there's probably a chance that there could be some in your peas as well. Um, this is what damage looks like uh, when you have lagus feeding. So you get these little black spots on the outside of the, the pod. And then when you open that up, these seeds are shriveled or completely missing. And then at harvest, this is what a damaged uh, pea, lagus bug pea looks like. And so this is a healthy one or, or a nice fully formed one on the left and then an injured pea where you have these hull perforations and this dimpling almost on that pea seedling or pea seed, pardon me, that would be downgraded for lagus damage. The last pest I want to talk about in season is grasshoppers. So on the left, we have the grasshopper forecast from last year. And on the right is what actually happen. So we overlaid this red color across Saskatchewan because um, when the ministry does their surveys, they do them typically when the, the most common time for grasshopper emergence is. And that's um, early July. This year in 2023, however, we were about two to three weeks earlier in growth stage and temperature uh, compared to normal. And so end of May, early June got really hot and it stayed like that for two to three weeks. And I had faba beans flowering June 15th when typically they don't flower till about July 10th. So we were quite a bit ahead and the grasshoppers followed suit. So they emerged much earlier than normal and they grew voraciously and ate voraciously and they did significant damage, not just in our lentils and Southern Saskatchewan, but all the way up to Meadow Lake, I was getting calls about, we have grasshoppers, we've never seen grasshoppers like this, what do we do about them? And so due to the weather that we've had this winter, you know, we didn't have snow at Christmas even, we've had warm conditions, dry, we're going into another dry season, Dr. James Tansey from the ministry is stating, you know, if we had that kind of a year with grasshoppers last year, be prepared to see it again. We should not be surprised if we see similar grasshopper activity as we did last year. And finally, I'm going to move into harvest considerations. So I didn't, I took out the slide that I had for insects on um, control options. There are a number of, of insecticides that are registered. Um, we don't have group three anymore though. So we don't have Lambda and that leaves just a handful of other products like Desis, Corrigin, Carbine. Um, that's really the, the breadth of the control options we have for in-season pests in, in our pulses. Um, but moving on to, to harvest, so we're nearing the end here. When we look at the field pea growth staging guide, so this is a really, really nice visual guide produced by Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers. And you can see all the way through from emergence to harvest. And what we're really looking for is, um, you know, R5 to R7. So R5 is the beginning of maturity. So you've got lower leads and pods are starting to turn yellow. What we're really targeting for any type of desiccant application is R6. So you want yellow seeds in the pod cavity at one or more nodes. And what I like to do is, and what I was taught to do is the shake test. So you go out there into the field and do the rattle test. And if it sounds like a maraca, you're probably good to go. But what we're targeting is 30% uh, moisture. And so when we're harvesting peas or looking to do a dry down application, you wanna use a desiccant. That's a true dry, dry down product. So a product like 
diquat or reglone um, will blast open those cell walls, allow the moisture to drain to evaporate out from that plant and uh, will have true dry down, but it doesn't kill the plant itself, which means that if we have a rain afterwards, it can start to regrow. Glyphosate is weed control. It is not a desiccant. So I know that there's products out there that are labeled harvest aids, but if you have to mix them with glyphosate, that is not a desiccant. And there are the keep it clean campaign um, and our MRL issues, Pulse Canada has made it very, very clear that there are trade issues with spraying glyphosate on your pulses. And so strongly, strongly, strongly encourage guys to, to practice using a desiccant. Do not spray glyphosate if you can help it. Um, and if you do, make sure you talk to your buyer. So what we want to do with that desiccant is apply it when the crop is at 30% moisture or less. And that is that um, R7 at full maturity. And so we see that the bottom pods are, the seeds are completely hardened. When you crack them open, they don't, they don't uh, hold a thumbnail imprint and they're completely hard. They don't split in half. The middle pods, the middle 30% of the plant, um, it does, the seeds will hold a thumbnail imprint. And then the top 30% of those pods or seeds will split cleanly in half when you apply pressure to them. So that's the optimum timing for a desiccant application. Um, Again, like I said, spray too early, you'll have MRL issues. You can also have reduced seed size and shrinkage and shrinkage of that seed coat. And if you apply it too late, you can have seed coat cracking. So it'll suck all the moisture that we need to have in that seed. And then you have the seeds are at higher risk for mechanical damage going through the auger and the combine and, and so on and so forth. If you have any questions on any of this, please feel free to, to contact me. I think we have time now after this. But that was what I had. And I will end stop sharing here and I can take any questions. Thank you so much for presenting. Is there any questions for Megan? I, I have, <clears throat> I always have a few questions, but um, that, that was great. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't even know how you keep all that in your head because that was so much information. So um, one question I had is you put up the Saskatchewan disease and incidents map. Do you know if Manitoba and Alberta do those too? Yeah, I believe that they do. Um, you'd have to go to their individual ministry websites okay. and look them up. They, they're they conducted, the surveys are conducted a little bit differently to how, how we conduct them in in Saskatchewan, I know Manitoba definitely does. There might be some differences. Um, I know there are not there might there are differences in Alberta, and you might have to go to APG's website to get that information rather than the ministry, because their crops extension group. I think they eliminated the crops extension group in Alberta a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. We still have it, but Alberta cut funding to that resource, unfortunately. <clears throat> and the other thing you oh. mentioned, oh, somebody else. Oh, yes, yeah, somebody else a question. So I'll go, I'll ask this one question quick and then we'll go on. Sure. Um, you mentioned that um, when you're seeding into a, like a high nitrogen situation for a guy with seeding peas can mean low nodulation. Do you, do you see anything in terms of effect on yield with that? Um, so if you have 25 to 30 pounds and you don't inoculate, so if you have 25 to 30 pounds residual nitrogen and you choose not to inoculate, I would expect there to be a reduction in yield because by the time that crop gets into pod fill, there's no nodules there for it to fill those seeds. If you have more than 50 pounds, the plant isn't going to nodulate. And if you have a really great growing year, like we could have a bumper crop, um, it could run out of nitrogen and not fill the full potential. But that's a very fine line to walk. So what we always recommend is Put the inoculant down because you don't want to run out of nitrogen. Um, you don't want to rely on just what's the present in the soil. That being said, if you have 100 pounds of nitrogen residual. Why are you seeding peas? <laughs> well, why are you seeding peas? But also, if you are going to go ahead and seed peas, you could probably get away with not using it an inoculant, right? Like, I, I had a slide that I didn't show, but peas use just as much nitrogen per pound per bushel as canola does. So if you want to figure out your yield target and do that simple fertility balance, balance that equation, if your year, yield target is 65 bushels and you have 100 pounds, like you can figure out that gap and then 
it comes down to economics for the guy. Does it pay to inoculate if I have that much nitrogen in the soil? And what's my organic matter, right? Because you're going to have some mineralized throughout the season. This year, if we don't have moisture, it's not going to matter much. Right. Yeah. Right. Also, I didn't put that in there as well, but um, the question that came in was double inoculating. Mm -hmm. And this kind of bridges the set. This, what I'm going to say, is going to bridge both of these. So we did a study a couple of years ago, uh, 2020, 2021, on inoculating versus fertilizer applications in a drought and what type of inoculant, so what form of inoculant actually benefits. And what we found is that it didn't matter whether we inoculated or fertilized. If there's no moisture, it doesn't matter. But if there was a little bit of moisture, enough moisture for the, for the crop to get going, if you use a liquid inoculant or a peat inoculant, inoculant on the seed, you'll have more nodules on the crown. If you use a granular, you're going to see more nodules on the secondary root system, so further out, and the plant has to grow to intercept it. So in a drought, we actually saw equal yield performance from a liquid inoculant as we did from a granular, which we typically don't, um, in perfect growing conditions, you kind of see the opposite. So it's the granular will perform best, then the peat, then the, the liquid. But in a drought situation, because that inoculant is right there on the seed, um, that actually performed the best. And in some cases, a little bit better, although it wasn't statistically different from the granular inoculant because they were right there on the crown and it did, the plant didn't have to grow to intercept those rhizobia. Um, is it worth it to double inoculate? So is this, typically we, we double inoculate in soybeans. That's the recommendation for soybeans if you haven't grown soybeans a lot. Um, but this is specific to peas. Brett, is that correct? Or just in general? Yes, okay. Um, so if a guy has never grown peas before, not a bad idea. Um, the rhizobia that we have for peas is actually native to our soils in Saskatchewan and in Western Canada. So there is native levels of rhizobium. I always screw this up. Let go <laughs> of the rhizobia. I'm not even going to try to say it. I always screw it up. We do have um, native levels of that rhizobia in our soil, but if you put an inoculant down, just one treatment, it should be fine. I wouldn't be too concerned about needing to double inoculate with with your peas because in soybeans we double inoculate because that rhizobia isn't native to our, our Western Canadian soils. That's why we have that recommendation. But do a really good job. <laughs> if you're using a liquid or a peat, do a really good job. But once should be enough. Awesome. Any more questions for Megan? Perfect. Well, thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate it. That was an excellent presentation. Definitely learned lots. So uh, okay, yeah, thanks. I'm going to carry on and go over our presentation here. But Megan, you are free to leave or stay, whatever you prefer. Okay. Um, do you want the slide deck, Carissa? Yeah, that'd be awesome. Okay. I'll, I'll convert it to a PDF and I'll email you. I am going to jump off though. So good luck, everyone. Thanks. Thanks for having me and have a good day. Right on. Thank you. Bye. All righty. So I'll get started. Can you see my presentation, Jody? Okay, perfect. So I'm going to go be going over our yellow pea varieties that we have. <clears throat> so we have three yellow peas. So we have one that's out for certified seed right now, and then we have two more down the line. So what's out for certified seed right now is we have our AAC Aberdeen. So Really great yield. They're 106% of Lacombs, great stander, medium seed size, and then it has resistant to powdery mildew and an I rating for Fusarium wilt. Um, this is kind of hard to read, but this is from the Manitoba guide. There's a SAS seed guide and the Alberta seed guide as well. So it yielded 101% of checks in Manitoba, 108 and 107 in Saskatchewan, and then 100 and 102 in Alberta. And then what's to come? So CDC Engage is a new yellow pea from Dr. Tom Walkerton. It's yielding 104% of checks. It has improved seed coat breakage and it's about medium maturity. So estimated launch year is around 2026. I am bringing it up now just because you're gonna start seeing this in more trial data and everything like that from us. 
And just kind of looking at it here. So it was in the Saskatchewan Seed Guide, but it wasn't in the Manitoba and Alberta Seed Guide this year. It yielded 107% um, in both the North and the South. And this is from the CDC, I mean, the co-op testing um, from 2020 to 2021 up top here. So it yielded 104% of Amarillo and Lacombes. And then we have another new variety, that's yellow pea, CDC 5845, from the CDC breeding program from the SPG. So it does have a VUA attached to it. It's also yielding 104% of checks, and it has improved seed coat breakage. This will also be launched in 2026. So you can kind of expect to see both varieties there. And it was in the SAS seed guide and the Manitoba seed guide this year. So it yielded 107% in the south and north in Saskatchewan and 101% in the Manitoba Seed Guide, and then 104 in the co-op registration trials. I'll also quickly be going over our high versus low management demo trial. So Mark Vincent does a surveillance and trial data for us. So basically the objective is to help us evaluate the Alliance Seed portfolio under high versus low management regimes. Um, and then we'll be able to provide agronomic recommendations of rotor varieties um, from there for retail staff. So high versus low demo trials. So for the peas on the high management side, we had a seed treatment in Sure Pulse, and then it was double inoculated with granular and liquid. 40 pounds of pea, 40 pounds of K, and 20 pounds of sulfur for fertilizer. It was also treated with Procoat and then two passes of fungicide. And then on the low side, we had no seed treatment, a liquid inoculant, 25 pounds of pea, zero of K and sulfur, and then one pass of fungicide. So just looking at it here, so the green bar is high management, yellow bar is low management, and then we also have protein on here as well. So the gray bar is high management and the orange bar is low management for the protein. So as you can see here, not really a statistical difference on AAC Aberdeen's and CDC Engage as far as high versus low, but there was a definite increase here on the CDC 5845 between high versus low management as far as yield goes. Uh, when you look at the protein, there was a difference on the AAC Aberdeen's on high versus low and same as the 5845 but CDC engage remain consistent no matter what, if it was high or low management. So that is all I have. Is there any questions? Awesome, well, thanks everybody for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And yeah, that's all I have. I will leave this on the screen here for a couple minutes for, for people to grab as well. Thanks, Alliance ladies. You're welcome. <laughs>